So Stephen, you're now recording? Yep. Excellent. I would like to begin with an acknowledgement of country. USQ would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which we gather. And I'm doing this from USQ because that is the place in which I find myself today, the lands upon which I work and live. I would like to pay my respect to any elders, past, present and emerging. And I would very much like all of you to reflect upon the land on which you presently work and live. And you can add those within the chat so that, um, so that we are aware of the diversity of the people who are present here today. I'll pass over now to Stephen, who can, uh, who can introduce our speaker for today. Hi, everyone. We're really excited to have Sarah Lambert here with us today from Deakin. And she's an educator, a researcher, and an advisor with a critical social justice perspective. She's got 20 years of experience in teaching, curriculum, technology, strategy, and project management in higher education. And she's currently focused on student equity roles. She submitted her PhD uh, with Deakin University in 2019 on the use of free online technology to advance student equity and social inclusion. And she's currently undertaking a number of research and collaborative research uh, publishing projects, including follow-up projects after leading the national research project into OER textbooks from an equity perspective that we'll hear more about today. So thank you for being here, Sarah, and uh, take it away. Thank you so much. And I will um, very soon find that really magic button <laughs> to get myself into slideshow mode. Oh my heavens, I have such an issue. <clears throat> Where are we? Will it work from here? Yay, okay. Oh, terrific. So um, how lovely to be back at the OEP SIG. It's, it's been a while and um, I'm coming to you from Jaja Warung country, which is two hours north of Nam, Melbourne, um, up near the Castle Main area, um, where I have the very great privilege of now living and working after a bit of a tree change, just pre-COVID actually. Um, and it's... Um, it's interesting, I, I've been working on Open Textbook Project. I'm going to obviously speak about the some insights into those outcomes today. And I think this probably will be the last presentation that I'll do um, on this one. I've been presenting and have, have done a few already. So this one we're going to focus not so much on the nitty gritty of the study, but the um, implications for Australian policy and advocacy. Um, and what I'm working on currently is, is much more about Indigenous knowledge recognition within open educational practices. So um, it's just increasingly important to, to me to um, be part of making space for academic knowledge um, in all academic circles. So it, it's um, really lovely to share our territorial um, acknowledgements, um, both of us here <laughs> and um, in the chat. And um, it will be exciting, I think, in future presentations to, as I said, do a bit more of a deep dive into OEP and Indigenous knowledge, which is some exciting work that I'm doing with um, collaborators, um, Joe Funk um, up in Charles Darwin and also Tuskeen Adam over in, um, well, she's quite global, actually. <laughs> but um, what are we talking about today? <clears throat> I don't really feel like I need to give you guys the definition of open textbooks, hey? Um, in the report, I did end up using a very simple definition from Spark. I know there's, you know, multiple ones. Um, but I think the, the point when I'm talking to wider audiences is this is, um, these are resources that, yes, they're free for people everywhere to, you and re to use and repurpose, but they're not... Um, they're not without support. These are institutionally and philanthropically funded. Um, in the US, as we know, they've emerged out of problems relating to costs, um, but we're now thinking more broadly about their potential. And, um, you know, I, I'm not going to go into, but, you know, in a, um, in a, a trad presentation for a sort of non-OEP audience, I, I would talk a little bit more about that American literature and where that all comes from. Um, I meant to say um, it's a really great 
uh, pleasure to present this particular take on it. I did present it recently for the OER 22 conference over in the UK, and it's just great to just go again and do it for the OEP SIG audience and make sure that we have that local conversation, which is, of course, different to what happens in a, in a UK based space. So thanks for having me. Um, we know open texts in Australia, uh, many of us, it feels very present and exciting, but it has had a long, slow burn um, and we're relatively new to it, but there's definitely a sense of picking up the pace, which is awesome. Um, compared to overseas, you know, our Australian legislation, that, that higher education legislation that protects against, you know, forcing students to pay for certain things has been something that just doesn't happen in other places and and as you do more research from the Australian perspective you begin to understand how significant that 1970s legislation was and the role um, that it produced for our libraries to do particular things that are also pretty special so um, but we definitely have appetite for local versions and I'm sure you guys have been part of what's happening which is terrific but as you know, we do not have the federal government doing anything for higher education funding generally, let alone for open um, education. Uh, we have had a funding and policy void for some time. Um, we have some very limited equity funding, which I'm hearing on the grapevine is being used to do some pockets of things that may include some OER, but that's extremely new and very spotty I would say and we, we just don't have big philanthropic funders um, with, with a few exceptions but certainly none focused on general education as far as I'm aware and I have looked a number of times. So what that means I think is that institutional policy levers are absolutely crucial and I, I just feel that this is the situation that we, we find ourselves in. So very um, interested to hear uh, when we get to our discussion if this is ringing true for you. But certainly I, I consider that what we do have in Australia that's sort of a bit more baked in than some other places overseas is this sense of libraries as real superpowers. As I said, they've been long-standing advocates for um, for, for digital, particular physical and digital access of learning materials, digital um, reading lists, which are you know much slower to be to be happening overseas as a sort of standard thing. Um, I'm still I'm teaching a master's course at the moment with a lot of main, mainland Chinese students who have never come have just never been given free digital materials through the library, they are absolutely gobsmacked at the wonder of Australian higher ed library role. So we need to remember how, how good that is um, and, and hang on to that for sure. But we also, we also collaborate a hell of a lot more. So our kinds of um, uh, the, the, the sort of the number of universities is small enough that we can, we do we just get together you know all the librarians get together the e-learning people get together the IT people get together and then all of those people get together as well so um, and it's been really amazing seeing our um, Council of Australian University Librarians or call driving this new OER collective as part of this enabling a modern curriculum project and I just think that's exactly the kinds of things that we've always done and it's just awesome that uh, that is happening now. The study, the National Scoping Study of Potential of OER Techs in Australia, um, I think we did, um, you know, we had, gosh, how many unis? We did five unis. <laughs> um, and then we, we talked to both students at two unis and staff at the five unis. So we had a mix of masters and undergraduate, local and international. We had across the universities, we selected for not only people who are keen, but also differences in practices. Um, those that are just sort of monitoring, adopting, those that were in already investing in authoring and um, also adapting OER with students as a sort of a new emerging practice. So there was also a national online survey of teaching staff about textbook usage and open textbook interest and that um, that was promoted to people with just an interest in digital teaching, not particular 
to, to OER. So all in all, we got a, a really great picture of what's going on and the kind of potential levers for expanding. We took a social justice approach to that. So our research question is to what extent do open textbooks have the potential to act as social justice initiatives in Australian higher education uh, as they do overseas. Finally, that report is fully out. So um, it took a long time to get that one approved, um, but now it is up on the on the funders website, but it's also linked to the project website. So this is funded by the National Centre of Student Equity in Higher Education, which is otherwise known as NESHI, <laughs> another acronym. So with many thanks to um, Deb Baff in the UK who worked with me on a, a sort of, um, we collaborated together to produce some simple sketch notes summaries of the main findings. So I'm gonna whiz through these just so we all kind of have a broad understanding of what, what went down at, at a big level. So basically um, we found that um, OER textbooks and diversified open access reading lists can provide social justice benefits for um, certainly our underrepresented, under-resourced and international students. Um, and that related to a reduction in racist and sexist stereotypes in the curricular materials, as well as um, increasing a sense of belonging um, through those reductions in stereotypes. And um, that's on top of the reduction of cost for study, um, which of course is already known um, in the literature, but our, our um, research certainly affirmed that. Um, but it also talked about the benefits to all students, not just those who are underrepresented. So um, it talked about OER textbooks and diversified open access reading lists pro providing a more general set of benefits. And yes, the free resources could be part of it, but that wasn't always, um, although it was sometimes the case, there's definitely a potential to address this increasing frustration around the digital licensing restrictions and the way in which our digital publishers are just putting more and more um, hoops to jump um, in front of um, being able to get um, unfettered digital access through the library. So um, seamless integration into LMS was also seen as another um, quite a strong benefit for a, an inclusive and sort of holistic learning experience for all students, not to be jumping between different spaces and places. But also because of the way in which these texts can be up to dated, up to dated, is that a thing? <laughs> Made up to date, increase the up to datedness of the knowledge, um, then those can be made inclusive of a range of multicultural in, in Indigenous knowledges. Um, and those increase students' preparedness to, to function as, as a graduate with um, a whole range of outcomes and knowledges, much more better prepared for the professions in a diverse workforce. So having a, a greater um, perspective is definitely um, a graduate asset for all students. And that was um, a key finding that we hadn't really considered going into the study. Um, of course, resourcing is always important and um, people who had undertaken um, fairly substantial size OER authoring projects were very cognizant of the amount of time um, and resourcing that would need and large scale scale up projects and grants. But many of our more experienced um, OER practitioners were also very interested in just scaling things down to small incremental OER that were actually able to do with much a smaller time commitment, a smaller resourcing within the university too, including some that could be done as part of a business as usual teaching prep course renewal. They really um, often wanted to get some maybe some marking buyout, but not really interested in having to take off a whole of teaching. Um, really wanted access to the expertise in the library and graphic design. I, some people wanted that more than actual funds because they didn't really have the time to expend any. So they just wanted to do what they could with their time and get access to expertise and have all of this sort of recognised. So I think that's important that um, bigger is not always better was what we found. And um, in terms of institutional recommendations, we did make a lot. <laughs> um, 
the report, we'll, we'll, we'll do it in detail, we'll, we'll touch on some, but I think a lot of it, it came through this central idea of reframing OER projects beyond a technology rollout. And, and I think you can do that, of course, but there was a missed opportunity in doing that um, in the Australian context where, as we I sort of hinted at before, all of our institutional policy levers, the things that we currently think are important, that's kind of what we've got to hang our hat on in, in this kind of federal um, policy void. So um, we recommended uh, broadening the scope of OER projects to, in, to have um, equal social inclusion and economic benefits in a nutshell. Um, we sort of suggested thinking about whatever strategic di digital innovation is current, and there always seems to be something that's current, and think about um, thinking about integrating OER into your vision for that, you know, thinking about linking it to gender policies, to your gender parity issues, to Indigenous reconciliation, cultural safety, um, ideas you might have for curriculum renewal and so on. Things that are eventually, you know, are going to lead to positive change in the classroom and that's never stale. <laughs> Um, in, in higher education. And so, you know, we encourage people to connect the dots as well between um, the education and the research spheres to garner support for that, that sense of openness and open scholarship as a joint, as a joint effort um, across teaching and um, research. And I must say in my, in my current day role at um, RMIT as an equity advisor, I, I'm very pleased to be advising on the development of new open access or actually open scholarship, I should say, policy where the scope across these two spheres is um, very um, much in, in, in uh, scope. So that I think is terrific. Um, of course, recognition in various ways, workload promotion, probation. We, we know about that internationally. Um, it's, it's the same here. Grant funding, as we said, yes, we can do that stuff. We have grants for, for big curriculum renewals. Let's, let's make OER part of that potentially. Um, lots of guidelines and um, capacity building needs to happen. So we, we put together quite a lot of recommendations that again are reframing these projects in terms of combining the social inclusion with the open access sort of um, benefits. And, um, and that might include doing things like, um, like having say, you know, guides lists of, of OER that actually amp up the kind of diversification of authors and examples and the sort of blending of knowledges in the way they do things or um, workshops on reviewing all of your reading lists are all of your authors actually white and are most of them male and is it time to perhaps refresh that up to a more diverse um, reading list because that really tells people who you're citing, you know, who you think knowledge comes from and that's sending a powerful message to who's in your class. So um, various kinds of guides for, for um, shifting the dial on, on that kind of um, thinking in the way we could approach teaching and learning and resourcing and assessment, um, which is a lot more than just, you know, we've got press books, would you like to play? I suppose. Um, and so, of course, in terms of the social justice components, yes, there's, there's things, uh, policy ideas, we institutions who want to make a difference in this inclusion and justice space could take on. You know, new courses, you've got to specify OER before commercial. Um, OER, you, you've got an open book exam and the book costs over X, you're going to have to specify um, an OER for that. Um, this book you want to provide, the publishers just decided not to give access to, to the library, you need to pick another textbook. Um, targets and timelines for OER adoption. Commercial textbook platforms, if we're going to have them, it's a bit of deja vu for those of us who've been in e-learning for a while, you're probably going to need some accept acceptable use guidelines before that those commercial platforms need to meet before um, you kind of feel comfortable endorsing your staff and to to go with those to sign those sort of contracts we could we could you know make those kinds of um, policies and also just investing in strategic sector-wide collaboration we're not a huge sector there's been a lot of work put into uni transitions 100 level um, kind of curriculum reform surely if if we had two or three um, 
institutions, academics who are up for it, you know, that would be what it would take to get an Australian, a really good diversified Australian version of um, our various sort of 100 level um, intro OER that's going to obviously have uh, transform the numbers because 100 level are, you know, big enrolments. So I think then to get to the nutshell, um, and what I've been reflecting on recently is I just feel that this is quite a different kind of advocacy narrative here than we see in the literature overseas about OER policy. And that normally goes, you know, you need an OER policy and that OER policy will bring investment and then students and staff will benefit, you know. And I think that would be great. Um, and it certainly has functioned um, in North America uh, and the United States and, and in Canada in various ways. But what I'm seeing here is something I think more like this, where in actual fact, it's sort of, we've got current institutional strategic project areas and those are all potential OER levers. And um, they provide access to a kind of investment, but it's the investment we make in our staff and in, in small grants. So, you know, in the teaching and learning, um, possibly in the research is dissemination space, you know, it could come from anywhere. Um, and so OER are being created already using in, these, in this kind of a way and solving bigger problems. And so this frames OER as something that actually can activate a policy. And some of those policies like Indigenous reconciliation I'm finding are incredibly aspirational. No one really knows what to do about that. But if you can say we're going to co-create uh, an Indigenous version of, for example, Adrian, you know, the um, physiological text <laughs> for diagnosis of all of the skin conditions, which has been discussed as a, um, an issue um, in... Uh, uh, in many spheres for a while now, you know, if people um, can do that, then OER is, is making real an aspiration, which a lot of people hold, but sometimes struggle to go, well, what, what will we actually do about it? So I think that um, by showing people what a great diversified OER looks like, might actually illuminate some of these existing um, policy levers, which are very current in the Australian context. And at the moment, I'm thinking particular post-COVID digital renewal is, is big in many places, particularly where um, digital wasn't strong before COVID. And now it's kind of like hitting the top of the pile for um, so perhaps more campus-based institutions. Students as partners popping up everywhere. The co-creation element, um, a really strong way to do things, making sure that you're not just, you know, bringing the already um, prestigious, already um, fairly privileged white students on that journey of becoming bigger leaders, but you're bringing a range of students on who come from a range of backgrounds and they're also contributing that bigger knowledge set through potentially bringing different knowledge um, traditions to um, the project. Curriculum renewal, as we said, oh, that never seems to get old. Um, they call it different things, but um, it might be it might be where some OER could actually happen um, by by bringing really thinking about how we up to date things quickly. And indigenous reconciliation, as I said, is huge. We have so many policies looking to do things there, um, often um, fledgling and and as I said, needing uh, in some cases to really pin down particularly for teach, you know, day-to-day -day teaching stuff, well, what can I do to, to contribute? You know, I can't, I can't do X, but I can actually embed some knowledge um, in, in, uh, in a resource, even a small one. Digital equity, another big possibility there. And so really that's it for me. That's what I um, have been reflecting on and I'm keen to, to hear your thoughts and, um, and see if that resonates and if there might be some already, maybe it's already happening. Um, I certainly heard in the UK a uh, couple of really cracking examples of exactly, exactly this, um, where uh, funding was coming through for OER projects through completely different types of um, project priorities. So that was um, great to have that hunch reaffirmed for that 
non-US uh, market over in the UK, but I'm super key, uh, keen to hear from you all. So I'll unshare that now. Thanks so much for that, Sarah. Yeah, a lot of rich points made in that presentation and particularly liked how you address such a broad sweeping kind of institutional challenges and they're often the Pandora's box for a lot of us that we're <laughs> either struggling with or trying to solve. Mm. So I'm sure uh, several of you have um, found that provocative and have some thoughts, comments or questions. So anyone want to kick that off? You can either ask a question in the chat or you can turn on your mic. Adrian? Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, as as you were you were speaking through the examples of um, the types of representation and the types of social equity um, outcomes that you can get with openness, uh, I couldn't help thinking that that this is realistically what we should be doing with the curriculum anyway, whether it's open or not. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering um, what your thoughts are on um, what are the specific affordances of openness that enable this if somebody says well our curriculum is doing that we're doing curriculum refresh we're rewriting our study guides they don't have to be open to achieve the same um, outcomes how would you answer a, a question like that um as someone as working from a social justice perspective i'd i'd have to say go your hardest because i think you know, what's the, um, what is, it depends on what you're trying to, what, what you believe openness can do. But um, I believe in social justice as, as the, the key, you know, what motivates me. So I'm a little bit agnostic about how they get there. But in practical, in practical sense, um, we just heard from quite a few authors who had invested in writing commercial texts and were deeply frustrated with their earlier selves and their earlier selves decision and gave us long narratives about how um, the one that really got me was it wasn't um, it was just little things like they just absolutely refused to update their text like imagine right like imagine investing years of your life into this text and it just sits and rots slowly on the shelf so they won't let you they won't let you update that thing and for the Australian academics who we spoke to about um, these issues of text and resources the lack of um, updatedness was one of the most common bugbears for and a reason why they would really like to get their hands on on doing something that they could get more up to date and why they love to see open textbooks it was often wow look at that I've never heard of these authors they're not the trad authors we see because now I think about it why do we we only see the ones from publisher x anyway and these ones are from Queensland and my God, it's so up to date, you know. So the up to date thing is a huge benefit for people who um, uh, just, I suppose, need a little bit of seeding. Like, well, have you thought about this one, you know? So um, I think there is some latency in in the um, this is already more up to date, and the more that we see um, catalogues coming on, like through the OEP SIG is sharing, oh look, these new Australian versions are out. You know, like, I love to share those because I know that people teaching those disciplines are looking for. Yes, they're looking for a better textbook, but they often particularly want one that's more up to date. And all of these new editions that are coming out of the Australian. Um, you know, folks who are taking the time and I, I express enormous gratitude <laughs> to you all. Um, those, every time you put one out, you open the eyes up of another bunch of people who are previously, frankly, no clue about open. So, um, yeah, there is some good news in it, I think. <laughs> <clears throat> It's too quiet, people. This is the informal OEP SIG where people just jump in and say stuff. <laughs> Angie? 
Hi everyone. Um, Sarah, I just wanted to ask, because I was interested to see that you included reading lists in your research. Yeah. Did you analyse the, the content of reading lists at all? So did you look at it from uh, whether the actual resources on the reading lists were open resources or whether they were just at no cost to students? Um, and then did you analyse them in respect to the people that wrote the different articles on the lists? That would be a whole new thesis. <laughs> Um, we did at one point um, when I had um, a couple more academics on the team um, have a sub project to take a selection of texts and do a, um, if you like, a diversity audit to see what was happening. But unfortunately, that one fell by the wayside due to COVID <laughs> redundancies, um, all of the crazy stuff, because this project actually hit in 2020 data collection so it was just um uh yeah we weren't able to do all of those things but um in our very early consultation um it was very clear that if we focus just on textbooks we were going to be shutting out half of the potential in the Australian context because we just do have a much lesser use of the one textbook, one unit kind of um, kind of pedagogy that is more prevalent in the states. So um, our practices with regard to the balance of textbook chapters, textbooks, articles, digital reading lists seems pretty much on par with what happens in the UK. We have a strong um, uh, reading list sort of a practice. So we just felt we were going to shoot ourselves in the foot and come up with um, inappropriate uh, sort of research if we didn't include the digital reading list. But yes, um, we acknowledge that for most people right now, that looks like something that is um, curated by the library and only open because of their um, licensing arrangements but not always you know we still there was some real innovators who had just gone holus bolus fully open web for all of their um, their programs and in some cases um, in the early stages we found that some of the academics were um, and I was at Deakin at the time so we, we're talking about an organization that's been doing distance digital fully online digital for a very long time, um, they were more prepared to drop the textbook completely than replace a commercial one with an open textbook. But they were very open to having everything open web um, as a full um, online experience. So the context of the institution and their history with um, onlineness uh, made a difference to that, that uh, reading list versus text and similarly different disciplines that you still had the sciences uh, in the 100 levels which is still quite committed to a textbook um, so it's the, the research needed to scope across um, very broadly I hope that makes sense <laughs> thanks go for it hey Sarah how are you? Hey, yes, I'm. Uh, I'm. <clears throat> you know the answer there, Frank. For everyone else, I've just recovered from COVID, and I'm trying not to cough at you. <laughs> um, I'm just <coughs> asking a question around. Um, I know personally that I struggle uh, with assisting or facilitating access to those marginalised voices and, and representing those in a textbook or a work that potentially an academic might want to write or rewrite. I just wonder if you have any tips around how we go about helping an academic staff member achieve that. Mm. I think that it is a journey um, and I've been in that place for a very long time too where you feel that, um, you know, as a white settler lady, I'm not about to start talking on behalf of Indigenous people because that's even worse form than sort of shutting up, as we know. But it, it, you, we can't sit on our hands. And, in, and if we take the example of our Indigenous um, colleagues, they are begging for us as settlers to do more because they are just exhausted having to be the solo mover and shaker for all things Indigenous knowledge. So at the moment, um, there are just so many new websites, um, guides, YouTube clips, um, blogs, uh, <laughs> You know, heaven only knows some um, uncles from the central desert doing awareness raising about a range of topics that just gone on to TikTok. So honestly, 
Um, what we've got to do in the first instance is connect our, our um, staff with the voices that are already putting themselves out there, you know, and they're there. And we just have to, I think, be confident and say, look, this is a person there, they identify as an elder from so-and-so they've got this whole thing over here it seems like that might be useful how about you pop a couple of those in and just say look I you know here's here's an expert from this country they will have probably a different way of doing it I mean and I know at the moment um, there's some fantastic uh, cultural reconciliation guides I think most unis are doing them um, I had a uh, I'm in the process of doing one that's that's been over three modules over three hours and that's part of my journey. I learned heaps from that and I'm, you know, always learning more and those have heaps of resources in them. So I think it's just important that we each personally make that commitment to be a person who can keep pointing people a little more forward and just and just commit to get on the train with learning a little more as we go, knowing we don't know everything, but knowing that we are, you know, making progress. But I think um, it's probably simpler and easier and more about front of mind being um, being more leaderly around gender balance. I mean, honestly, it's only been since the 70s and <laughs> there are heaps of incredible um, female academics on every topic, but you do have to dig. And so, you know, we need to get more comfortable looking at journals like Feminism and The Thing, <laughs> Critical Issues of The Thing, which is where a lot of this stuff hides and just pull out authors and read them and go, wow, I've never, I've never heard of this, but this is just sensational. Go to conferences that are maybe just a bit out of your comfort zone and that just brings you into the world where those voices I've been talking for a long time and just not being heard. And I just don't think it's it's enough to go, well, I'm not that, you know, I'm not an expert. I'm like, <clears throat> if everyone waited till they're an expert to make a difference, we we wouldn't <laughs> We wouldn't be going nowhere near fast enough. So that's that's how I would approach it. Does that help? Absolutely. They're great tips. Thanks, Sarah. Mm, cool. Nice. Yeah, go for it. Hello, everyone. Hello, Sarah. Thank you for nice. that. Nice. Lovely. Yeah. Well, let's see you too. Um, so I just have a quick question, and it is related to new um, project that was starting in the TTS around OER. So my question is, um, and you mentioned that the findings suggest that advocacy narrative needs to start with finding the current strategic projects as potential OER levers. So I wonder um, if you have any suggestions about starting the conversation. So do you think it should be a top-down approach? I really don't like this term, but uh, mm. which with senior management or a bottom-up uh, with learning and teaching teams? Um, or could be finding, and that uh, could be another possibility, finding academics who are keen to build records and showcase. Um, my any opportunity is an opportunity and when you know your institution you just get a nose for it right like you've been there for a while and you know like is the new pvc incoming best buddy over within equity and inclusion are we signing up for that athena swan project and we're going to be all talking about women in the professions right away and everyone's going to be doing everything about that oh i'm going to go and talk to you and find who's got aspirations who's female got aspirations to write the proper gender inclusive leadership in any topic we're big on here and then have them ready to roll so that when the grants come out we go Woo, let's put diversity and inclusion authorship guidelines as an addendum to the grant scheme, just as a given, because we're now committed to these equity things. And then all of a sudden, the people who are applying, you're promoting that we're as part of this, we're also going to be asking you to, to work with us to just check off on these equity and inclusion authorship principles, you know, appropriate acknowledgement basic kind of things and then you know oh here's some authors who want to make sure that um, you know we, we're doing better for recognizing the powerful business or science leaders that we have and putting them in the case studies up front and center for our new textbook project you know like these conversations just swirl around and you've got to know 
which of them are happening and who is connecting, I suppose, and what's going to float their boat. So it, it just it just is going to shift. But I happen to know, Mace, that UTS has recently introduced a new graduate learning outcome for global, yeah? yeah. Now, um, I know that one because I've been working with Amanda White. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now, Amanda wanted to do an open textbook. I talked to her about diversification. <laughs> I asked her, my take on business texts is they're a bit woeful generally about gender and 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 I'm not too sure about race. What do you think yours is okay? And she said, oh, I should, let me just pull it down and have a look. And she pulled the textbook off and did what we all call the, the flip test. And the first two case studies that she saw of businesses owned by women, one was a hairdresser and one was a cake shop. Mm. And she shut the cover and went, we should have a look at this. <laughs> and then it evolved into a conversation. And then and then she said, oh, I'm getting, you know, pressure to 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 adopt this global learning outcome that has a, a whole piece in there about um, acknowledgement of Indigenous knowledge and respect. I'm like, hello. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there's now an introductory chapter that we've we had a number of conversations and it's framed around and, and this is hard. Don't think it's easy. Who wants to talk about accounting as an Indigenous practice when you just want to learn how to do accounting? I mean, this is a thing. But in actual fact, if you keep thinking it through, Amanda's like, well, you know, we have lots of students from China, Malaysia, from Asia, and they have, and we have lots of Middle Eastern students who have uh, a different practice and culture around actually money and what savings and value is. And she was already up on that, which is great. So it wasn't much of a stretch to be able to think about scoping the whole of that introductory chapter, what is knowledge on this topic that included. Um, and so then we just went crazy and tried to find more publications that kind of touched on that. Um, next thing you know, I'm at a conference and and Joe Funk from Charles Darwin, who I've done a bit of work on, said, oh, I've got a student up here who's just graduated and he's written an Indigenous business chapter perspective. And we're like, yes. <laughs> so these are the kinds of connecting to the community conversations that can just be the sort of pieces that you need to bring together. And once people read that, they go, oh, that's that's great. That's not. It's sort of big, but not big at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's fantastic. Um, mm. It kind of aligns with uh, something that um, our new um, um, PVC. Uh, uh, sorry, not the PVC. Um, Associate Dean Learning Teaching for Indigenous Graduate Attributes. That's yes. One. Yeah. And yeah. Then, um, that's what they're talking about. So that's fantastic. Thank you. So yeah, much. yeah, fantastic. Cool. Um, I'm very excited for this project, actually. So, um, mm. and I think one of the great things about the OEP SIG is that it does facilitate people sharing, you know, like that knowledge of who they have in their network who might be writing on that kind of topic, you know, so it's exciting. Yeah, I think it's possible and looking at um, partnering with institutions, and this is why I'm so keen on that cross-sector yeah. institution piece, right? Because our institutions serve different communities, let's be honest, you know. That, that often our regional institutions are serving much more culturally diverse audiences. And what that means is that their own staff and student populations are, are an um, incredible um, mm -hmm incredibly diverse and if you want to look at it a bit of an asset you know for, for this sort of co-creation type of things and 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 only if that already floats their boat and they're moving in that direction you know it becomes um, an opportunity to think beyond uh, your institution's notion of what culture is you know community they're serving but I am also keen uh, on those diversity and inclusion guidelines being part of our OER grants. If we could just do that for just about every OER grant, I think what that would do for changing the standard practice of just empowering people who work on these projects to just go through some checklists, have reflective time, get some support for 
um, searching for those resources. You know, the librarian or the learning designer's role could be to come and use the OEP and, and our media, social media, to try and connect with people who might be writing OER in those areas, you know. And I think that's what the OER collective of call is trying to do. So we can get in on that action as well. Hmm. Thank you. Sure. Yes, Adrian, that's exactly what I'm what I'm talking about um, is 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 linking your reconciliation policy with your, you know, your grant grant funding. Um, and I think that when I've looked at some of those DEI type of uh, checklists or authorship guidelines, um, it just it just prompts you with questions, you know, it just makes you think, oh, yeah, who, who have I got? Um, who, ha who am I relying on for uh, representing what the knowledge is, you know, expertise is in this particular topic? And it, it as long as you get a bit of help, I think it's a, it's a support. Sarah, were there any surprises in the results that you received from the survey or your experiences talking to people in the interviews? Was there anything that you didn't expect that kind of surprised you a bit? There was so much. <laughs> I think I, I probably would have to go back to the blog to get myself in the headspace because I blogged on those things as they came up and it, it's just, it's kind of, yeah, it's two years now. But um, I think the one that stood out for me was around this question of whether Australian students would really be that bothered by the cost of books when they don't really have to buy them, right? So in the States, they've got to buy them because they're, they're, that's just a, what is really the go. So um, most common wisdom around the academics I spoke to was, oh, look, that's, you know, we're so different from the States. That's not going to be a motivation. And it was a little bit poo-poo, like, you know, this open business is just a bit... <clears throat> minority report we you know our libraries fix that you know was was the thing and I come away from the student interviews in particular going oh boy we're um this idea that our libraries fix that that a lot of academics hold on to is just not true and it's not through any lack of huge effort by libraries but there are just systemic blockers by the commercial publishers to give them <laughs> the option of licensing things in a way that is fair. And um, there was plenty of, you know, there was overseas literature put out by a library associations affirming that in the UK, but um, the, the students just are, and this is two years ago, getting so fed up with only being able to get, you know, an hour's access or a key for that much or that much time or having to share or whatever. And we had um, increasing stories of creative ways to get an unfettered copy of texts. And what I found is that the first years we're attending were, um, you know, buying things because they kind of didn't really quite get the options or trying to find things second hand. And by the time third year came around, the students had just developed these really savvy processes to get around essentially the digital licensing restrictions and I just thought this is just ridiculous how do we want to burden our students with this much of their creative problem solving on bloody textbook access we could use all of that mental power on doing some awesome learning um, and that um, really surprised me because I was also in the bucket of thinking library they just sort of fix that um, so, yeah, the, the, the level of irritation around um, what the commercial publishers are doing was kind of, on the one hand, frightening. On the other hand, I kind of feel like almost the death knell for, um, you know, commercial publishing, frankly. You know what I mean? Like in some quarters, it's just, I'm just not doing that. I just won't do that. So, um, yeah, I don't know, COVID produce some complexity there but um, that level of irritation the emotional irritation that students felt was not something I'd heard spoken of um, on mass the way that it came through in the interviews and the disconnect between that and the academics the library's got this so I kind of feel like the library 
um, culture of serving everyone and trying to fix everything, which is so understandable, <laughs> is kind of a bit, um, almost need to kind of stop being that crutch, you know, it's almost need to peel back the veneer like they've done in the UK over their, their um, um, textbook broke kind of hashtag that went down over COVID and go, look, we can't fix this. <laughs> you've got to give us, you've got to give us some tools. You've got to give us some policies to, 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 to put us back up on a reasonable playing field of negotiation under these circumstances. That's, that's what it felt like in any case. All right. Stephen, I think you're on mute. Yes, we can't hear you at the moment. For the first time in my life, I, I did the thing where you hit the physical button. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Well done. Basically, what I said was, thank you, Sarah, you're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and that we <laughs> and that we were running out of time. And uh, so we we'll wrap up time. But yeah, we re really appreciate all your insights today. And um, especially, yeah, given you've been sick with COVID and um, we, we've known you've been working on this for a couple of years. So it's great to um, see the see the results and the implications as well the takeaways and what we can how we can use that to change our practice yeah um, so thanks Sarah and uh, I also do want to announce our next webinar uh, will be on the 21st of June at 11 30 and it will feature Angie Williamson who, who's here today uh, from Deakin on the grants program uh, for incentivizing open educational resources that she's been coordinating at Deakin. So that's pretty exciting. So that's, yep, 21st June, 11.30, and uh, go to our website, which I'll put in the chat in a second to keep up to date. You can also sign up for the email list. But for now, I'll hand back to Adrian for the farewell. I look forward to your presentation, Angie. And I, if I can just say one thing before we go, and I want to thank everyone who gave me the time to be interviewed. And I, I, I know many of you guys did. And um, and I, I spoke to Angie too, and, and her program there, um, the fledgling OER program was one of those ones funded through um, federal equity funding. So this is a, a, a precursor example. And I, um, I, I hope I haven't heard updates. I'll, I'll do my best to get to the next one. I really hope that that one continues to fly. That'll be exciting to hear. Well, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, and I think that we will definitely have this presentation up on the YouTube channel within the next week and we'll notify people as soon as that's up. I know that there was, uh, for this presentation in particular, we feel that a lot of questions from staff who said, I'm a member of the SIG, uh, can I bring friends? And uh, the answer, of course, is always yes. Mm -hmm. So um, this was of great interest to the sector. And I'm very glad that we're part of the, uh, the dissemination um, around the outcomes for uh, your, uh, your research. Um, you. I want to thank as well, Stephen, uh, for bringing everything together today. Stephen, um, in case you don't know, is, um, is one of the three co-conveners for the SIG, and Stephen leads our webinar program. So if you're enjoying the content and enjoying what is going on, you have Stephen to thank for that. Um, and also my, my thanks as well go to Angie for who will host the, uh, the next webinar. And I look forward to seeing all of you at the next SIG meeting or at the next webinar. Thank you very much everyone for coming along today and I wish you all the best for the rest of your week. Thank you. <laughs>